So my name is Fredo Tieno. I work for Legal Resources Foundation Trust uh, as the climate justice focal person. I also uh, am a mutual mkono for PSK providing some technical, little technical support. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been asked to talk about how we can connect or basically explore how we can connect the work that paralegals do with uh, the crisis which is climate change and try to identify a bit of concerns that uh, paralegals might be called upon to interact with. So basically that's going to form my engagement with you and I want us to pay a bit of attention because this is this is going to be the new kid on the block for para, for the practice of paralegalism in Kenya. So I'm going to start by um, sharing a bit on what climate change is. And I'm not going to do it because we don't know, we all know, but just to bring context in, into this conversation and perhaps highlight some of the impacts uh, that uh, climate change is having in our communities which are vulnerable and also try to look at the right side of engagement with climate crisis. So <coughs> basically climate change um, talks to the changes that are happening uh, that are bringing a bit of stress in uh, communities, their livelihoods, uh, their lifestyles, and so therefore some communities uh, remain vulnerable in terms of their own survival and also in terms of how they can also, you know, uh, survive as a human society. So this phenomenon uh, was largely unknown, but in the 20th, 20th century, when the world was going through a lot of change, uh, for those of us who are familiar with uh, the steps that, uh, I, I mean, uh, Earth took in terms of uh, development, the agrarian revolution, uh, industrialization, etc., etc. So when human society organized themselves and now they were able to, you know, start thinking about systems of uh, food, systems of uh, housing, systems of governance and everything, the human society needed a lot of materials to survive. And so industries came up, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they call them smoke, eh? From the industries, you know? And most of these industries were using uh, in it of fossil fuels. And it is believed that during that point is when there are a lot of emissions of carbon that impacted, uh, that uh, triggered uh, climate change. So it has been going on, and it is um, linked to basically human activities. You know, the everything that we do about how we, how we raise our economies, how we raise our foods, how we fight wars, you know, all that. We require energy to, you know, to drive all those processes. And therefore, humans have relied on um, fossil fuel to, uh, as the energy to drive that process. So um, let me provide a bit of a, a context to uh, climate justice, which is basically the work that paralegals who work in this context are basically interacting with. And uh, <coughs> it came out of realization that climate change impacts people in different ways. And so there ought to be a justice aspect to climate change. And so the concept of climate justice. So climate justice looks at um, 
connecting climate crisis to the social, racial, and also environmental issues in which it is deeply entangled. And it looks at uh, how differently it impacts uh, communities, their lifestyles, their, uh, commun uh, their, their lifestyles, communities, and also, um, yeah, basically, those communities as it were. So um, why are we talking about climate change as a rights issue? Um, experts uh, who are entrenched in the space of climate change recall that climate crisis uh, is the single biggest threat to our survival as a species and uh, is already threatening, threatening human rights around the world. And of course, um, we have global temperatures which are rising and uh, contributing to uh, climate uh, change. Um, and of course, uh, those temperatures are contributing to harmful effects uh, such as droughts, floods, a rising of sea levels, heat waves, extreme weather events, loss of biodiversity, and also the collapse of ecosystems. Um, and uh, so therefore the continent of all, of all this is having an impact in our lives. Uh, and of course, if it affects our lives, then it goes without saying that it's also affecting our human rights. So uh, if you look at uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it guarantees that all humans, all humans are entitled to a social and international order in which their rights or freedoms can be fully realized. And it goes without saying that climate change is threatening this, is threatening this order so that people are not able to fully enjoy their rights and also their freedoms. And therefore, without drastic action, which would require climate action, then this may not, this, the enjoyment of these rights may not be achieved. So uh, there's need for international co cooperation and also solidarity across states, across international uh, agencies, across communities, across borders, to promote uh, rights in the context of climate crisis. Um, then uh, <coughs> you also, uh, if, if you also look at what what the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says about um, uh, climate change, um, the office says that uh, as we address the issue of climate change, we have to concern ourselves with the rights of people in those places where uh, people are impacted by climate crisis. And if you also look at um, the Paris Agreement, which analyzes some of the responses to climate change, it talks broadly about uh, protecting the rights of people who are impacted by climate change. Um, and uh, there's also what we call the UN Panel on Climate Change, which is a UN agency. Uh, we have the COP meeting happening in Egypt, no, in uh, Dubai, it started on 30th. And whatever conversations that are taking place in that space, it's all about how to protect the dignity of uh, human beings and rights underlie that kind of consideration. Um, so you look at some of the reports um, of uh, UN agencies of how climate change is impacting uh, communities. Um, the fight against protection of rights may be lost if no proper strategies are put in place to ensure that in the context of doing climate mitigation and also adaptation, the clear uh, you know, there are clear strategies to protect the rights of those people who are being supported uh, to, you know, to overcome the, crisis, uh, the climate change crisis. So uh, the World Health Organization 
uh, report says that between 2030 and 2050, approximately 250,000 people will die uh, from uh, malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, heat stress, etc., etc. This is just how to link the climate crisis to rights to health. Uh, and you know, when there are these um, heavy rains that are falling and also um, they are very drastic, um, we know how malaria, <coughs> ma ma malaria uh, parasite is carried. Uh, you know, we know that heat wave al already kills many, many people, especially in Europe and also in the Americas and also in the Asia. So that's just a link of how, you know, um, right to health is impacted. And uh, FAO, which is the UN Agency for f uh, uh, Food and Agriculture, um, they say that um, uh, climate change is causing extreme weather, drought, flooding, and other disasters that are disrupting food systems, as it were. So as food systems get, um, get disrupted, it means that food security is not guaranteed to many, many people. And so it says that around 800 billion people um, may be food insecure if mitigations are not well, uh, well structured to address some of those key concerns. And again, World Bank also says that uh, by the year 2030, around 100 people would have moved into the poverty uh, bracket if no proper strategies are put in place. So some of the key issues that uh, I want to share with you which regard climate change and also how it, it impacts human uh, include um, the issue of water. Um, it is believed that there's already an ongoing water war, which is a, a global kind of world war but uh, the issue is water. So you find that countries from the Middle East that are coming to Kenya to try and improve their agriculture from uh, by accessing some lands to do some, uh, you know, some work on agriculture. Some countries are also coming to Kenya to do a lot of studies on uh, access to water because it is believed that, um, um, you know, safe water volume has been dwindling um, uh, drastically, and so maybe there's that focus uh, by rich countries to come to other regions where th th there still exist uh, adequate water, which is safe to drink. You look at the entire oceans; that water is not safe for, for drinking. And in places uh, where they have de deployed technology to use that water, the technology is so expensive. Yet in Africa, we still have water springs. Yeah, you can drink directly from the source. I remember last week we were in Kakamega with a team here and we were drinking water from the spring. So um, there's that bit of stress on water which is going to affect at least 2 billion people globally. Uh, UNICEF says by the year 2040, one in four children will be living in extremely high water stress areas. So you want to uh, you want to imagine uh, when you don't have water, then you know that community is exposed to waterborne diseases, you know, because uh, those who have done wash programs, uh, it is believed that if you can access water, then you are able to deal uh, deal with so many diseases that uh, you know are commonly found within households. Um, then according to the <coughs> International Displacement Monitoring Center, they say that extreme weather events constituted one of the main causes of IDP situations, whereby 28 million people in 2018 uh, were internally displaced because of the issue of climate change. Um, so uh, groups or individuals who are mostly um, impacted by climate change include those groups or communities that live in areas impacted 
uh, negatively by climate change. And in Kenya, we are talking about indigenous communities such as the Ogiek, the Endorois, the Ndorobo. We also have in this category migrants um, that uh, find themselves in some of those uh, climate stressed areas and also IDPs because of climate change uh, situation. Um, and of course, the rains in Mombasa last week, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, the El Nino phenomenon. And so communities that live in lowland areas, when there are, uh, you know, heavy rains such as El Nino, such communities get flooded. And of course, we talk about women, children, uh, disabled persons, terminal ill people, um, uh, as being also persons who undergo climate change vulnerability. So, how do we engage um, in climate change as right holders? So, um, in the context of human rights, <coughs> states are obligated to States are obligated to provide services and also relief uh, in issues in which climate change crisis is involved. And in some instances, people also become duty bearers by providing the taxation that the government needs in order to respond to some of those climate change uh, crises. Um, Yeah, and uh, of course, businesses have also been called upon to act as duty bearers in order to provide relief in instances where uh, climate change crisis makes communities vulnerable. And then that's where we have uh, corporations doing a bit of um, corporate social responsibility to support communities who are undergoing climate distress. So some of the obligations of the state include uh, mitigating climate change and preventing its negative human rights impacts. It's also supposed to ensure that all persons have the necessary capacity to adapt to change, to climate change, and also ensure accountable and effective remedy for human rights. Um, also mobilize uh, available resources for sustainable human rights based development and so you find that nowadays when uh, undertaking uh, development uh, programs um, you know governments are encouraged to uh, you know integrate approaches that also address issues around climate crisis so that development does not affect ecosystems and you might want to see um, some actions which have been around the Mao complex where in some instances the government has been forced to you know uh, uh, take some action to reduce human activities in those specific areas and of course the states have also been called upon to cooperate with other states because some of these uh, crises are cross-border, so that you, you find that um, climate uh, issues in Kenya may also um, um, be the same in Uganda or in the East African region. So that kind of collaboration is, is called upon. Um, and of course, states have been called to guarantee that everyone enjoys the benefits of science and its application to protect human rights from business harms. And uh, you want to look at the case, the Winouru case in Mombasa, where the state, uh, the state obligation to protect uh, the people was breached. And so communities went to court and uh, filed a public interest litigation. And then the court had to rule in the favor of the people. And of course, ensure meaningful and informed participation. And this is why we are having conversations on how to integrate paralegals into climate conversations. Uh, let me move to legal linkage to climate 
justice in Kenya. So, uh, under the Constitution, you want to look at Article 69 and also Article 70 that uh, obligates the state in respect of the environment, including sustainable exploration, ETC, and its enforcement of environmental rights, respectively. And you might also want to look at Article 162, which establishes the Environment and Land Court and the disputes that this court handles. So how do we harness what we call the Climate Justice Committee Paralegals uh, model into climate conversations or climate action or climate justice work? So uh, the Climate Justice Committee Paralegal model deploys paralegals who are well, well trained on the law around environment, land and climate to catalyze climate action in communities in which they live. They work within the context of climate justice centers. These are models that uh, LRF and its partners are trying to pilot uh, uh, in some few counties in, the counties in the country. And we believe that with more collaborations, we'll be able to expand the climate justice centers as the focal uh, climate justice action across the country. So these paralegals have been equipped with basic legal and technical skills that allows them to sensitize communities on legal policy and legislative frameworks that underlie climate change or climate action or climate justice as well as, as, well as facilitate referrals of communities undergoing climate stress to seek for action from duty bearers, which is in this case the state and also the business. Um, owing to specialization, owing to their speci specialization, um, they work collaboratively with other cadres that underlie climate action, such as the environmental rights defenders, a community climate mobilizers, and also climate justice activists. They work together in order to promote a climate action as it were. So why are we blending the climate justice uh, committee paralegals with other climate actions? We are doing this because climate conversations still remain largely an elitist conversation. And we talk about elitism. We mean uh, very few in the community can actually uh, tell what climate change is, but it doesn't mean that they don't know what it is. They know it <laughs> in their own language and is also using their own knowledge um, but you see if you start this conversation with them they'll be a bit lost so we are bringing on board these paralegals to you know uh, try and start these conversations with the communities and let them know that whatever they explain in their own words in their own knowledge is actually climate change which needs responses which organically come from their own knowledge and also engagement with the challenges that they undergo with um, with regards to the changing climate and of course climate change language is quite complex and also the legal issues policy legislation this are quite technical for ordinary communities and therefore the paralegal comes uh, in as the person to break down all these jargons for the communities to engage with the ongoing global conversations around climate justice. Um, and of course we want to look at the systems that mitigate uh, climate change and of course looking at um, agencies such as uh, NEMA, the National Envi Environmental Tribunal, the National Environmental Conference Committee or, or the Environmental Ombudsman's Office, the National Climate uh, Council, uh, these systems remain quite weak and so uh, we want to have a role for paralegals to engage with these systems to see where the weaknesses are and also propose how best to uh, strengthen the systems. And uh, most importantly, some of these systems have not been tested. And so our model of engaging paralegals is to also try to st test how strong uh, or weak 
these systems are and what can be do what can be done to strengthen them uh, and of course little information on climate change is available to grassroots communities and this excludes them this excludes them from the climate conversations that take place locally and also uh, internationally despite them bearing the burden of climate stress and of course these communities uh, are excluded for from public participation uh, that discuss issues uh, climate change so paralegal comes in at the catalyst to help bridge that particular gap um, so th therefore the paralegals are critical to secure securing the future of climate action in kenya and regionally and of course deploying this system ensures that uh, 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 disputes around uh, climate, um, around climate and also environment, uh, are also uh, um, sorry, um, disputes around the climate or environment are also uh, areas that the paralegals can engage the community in trying to identify to identify those disputes and also help with linking them with the justice systems so that they're able to access justice on the disputes that they might have come across uh, and of course uh, the paralegals are also helping in training a new uh, generation of uh, um, climate uh, paralegals also mentoring them and uh, also equipping them with skills on how to mobilize commu grassroots communities to promote climate action. Um, and of course, these paralegals also engage with the Environment and Land Court, which is the focal climate court in the country. Um, and of course, they undertake conversations with the community um, and, and also engage in uh, environmental protection work with communities in which they live and of course there's what we call um, uh, local climate financing uh, which also goes by the name of FLOCA. These paralegals are able to also link communities that are, are already doing some work on climate action with this kind of funding so that they may also benefit from this and expand their climate action work. Um, so as a means of uh, pushing for the case for this model, we realize that uh, paralegals have uh, paralegals who want to operate in this space have a lot of uh, have a lot of things to engage with. Um, uh, you look at the systems that have been created by the laws that uh, underlie a wildlife protection, for example. There are wildlife committees. Um, I think in every county and also every villages those are familiar with the with the acts that these paralegals can also uh, take part in and also provide some feedback from the community we also have um, health management committees uh, because some of the climate uh, uh, change responses require health responses and so therefore these paralegals can also take uh, take part in those committees we also have the village management committees, which are under the uh, County Government Act. And in this basis, they also discuss about climate change. We also have World Climate Change Committees and also the County Climate Change Committees, and also the County Climate Change Steering Committees, where these paralegals uh, may be able to make meaningful, um, you know, change or contributions to you know uh, promote climate action and of course community development agreements uh, this part of the amendments to the climate change act uh, with regards to carbon rights carbon credits and paralegals may be able to take uh, part in development of these community development uh, agreements um, and of course, the Environment and Land Court has the Courtiers Committee, where the paralegals may also uh, make meaningful contributions. 
um, and of course eco ecosystem re restoration with their knowledge they, they'll be they are able to engage communities on this and also leveraging on the community knowledge and uh, of course this the concept uh, known as um, loss and damage in terms of climate change and this, this is one of the wins during last year's uh, COP meeting in Egypt where you know uh, you know um, uh, state parties agreed that communities that undergo climate stress need to be compensated for the loss they undergo to their property and also the damage that they undergo to their property. So these are areas that paralegals can engage in and as well um, um, public interest litigation around climate uh, disputes, another area where they can engage in. So I'll leave it there. Maybe if you can pick a few reactions or questions uh, from the plenary. Back to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Fred.